Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining us today is Mark Scherenbrock, an award-winning author and speaker who was inducted into the National Speakers Association Hall of Fame. He's an Emmy award-winning writer and producer for an ABC television special and a recipient of several international film awards. As a young speaker, Mark appeared in a Jostens award-winning film, The Greatest Days of Your Life So Far, which featured Mark speaking and has been viewed by millions of people worldwide. The film was awarded the Golden Apple and the Silver Screen Award. Mark's brand and his mantra is nice bike, and it's more than just a compliment or a metaphor, but an engine fueled by three actions of acknowledging, honoring, and connecting with others, which he turned into his critically acclaimed and award-winning book, Nice Bike, Making Meaningful Connections on the Road of Life, winning the Gold Axiom Business Book Award, and the Silver IBPA Ben Franklin Award. So please join me now with the incomparable Mark Scherenbrock. Well, hello, Mark Scherenbrock. Thank you for joining me on Virtually Speaking. How are you doing, sir? Hey, hi, Chris. Welcome to Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes. All of them frozen right now. All 10,000 lakes are frozen. And so uh, let me guess, you're sitting on one of them right now. I am. I'm on a place called Cross Lake, ice fishing. It's a, it's a beautiful day. It's about 29 degrees. Sun's uh, muted. It's a good day for fishing. I mean, you, can, you can see the... Uh... <laughs> yeah. No, so now, if you catch a fish during this, uh, during this interview, what's going to happen? You're going to have to take I'll, it out I'll, of the water. I'll, I'll FedEx it to you. Oh, there you go. There you go. And yeah, that'll be awesome. What kind of fish are you going to catch? You know, on this lake, you see the walleyes, northerns, and some panfish. Walleyes today is what we're hoping for. It's the Minnesota's fish. I'll let you know if I get a bite. Okay, cool. That, that would be great. Yeah, we could just uh, have a little segment of reeling the fish in and whatever you need yeah, to yeah. do. Yeah, if the speaking thing doesn't work out, we can go to a sports show. That'd be fine. <laughs> there are fishing programs that I have been compelled to watch for at least oh, a few there's minutes sometimes. There's, so. a, there's a ton of them out there. Absolutely. I know. So nice bike. Uh, this is something that uh, you have stuck with a brand that I love the name of, and um, you know it's it's cool to meet somebody who has a uh, as a speaker who has a a real area of expertise that they themselves own um, and, and really have been focused on for the last you know decades or a decade at least. Right. So you're one of those guys, but yours is really your brand, which really is your message. And one thing I know about you that I love, a lot of speakers, you know, are, are filled with great content and takeaways. And there's a lot of tangible things for people to, to take home with them and, and use. But, the, but not a lot of speakers really focus on, you know, getting people to smile. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where you start. You know, with you, uh, it, it's all about the audience smiling. And even the message of Nice Bike is all about really evoking a smile in everyone you meet, uh, be it in business or on the street. So tell us a little bit about where Nice Bike, the phrase, the brand, the motto came sure. from. Well, you know, going back to your first point about we want an audience to have an experience. We want them to have a memorable experience. We want them to walk out of the session and an hour, a week, a month, a year later, still remember, hey, you know, it's nice to have a good speaker. what they talk about? What did you do differently? What was the impact? And so the nice thing about Nice Bike is it's got a hook and people remember Nice Bike years later. It's, here's how it happened. And so I'm, I'm from Minneapolis, flew to Milwaukee for a, a presentation. I uh, drop in Nina, Wisconsin, known for making manhole covers. Irrelevant point. So I'm in a, a rental car, beige Ford Taurus from Avis, driving north. And I realize that I just have dropped in and stumbled into the Harley Davidson 100th year anniversary. There were half a million hardcore bandana wearing leather, big chain on the wallet, attitude filled bikers. Look, I've never been on a, a Harley. I've never thought of myself as a Harley kind of a guy. But driving around Milwaukee, surrounded by all those Harleys, in my beige Ford Taurus, I wanted a Harley. I wanted to be part of that Harley tribe, you know? And I, I pulled over to a venue, because it's just curious. 
and I'm walking around looking at all this, and there's this big, huge guy, like right out of Game of Thrones. Big, huge beard, attitude filled. He looked tough, standing by his bike. Guy goes walking by and says, ah, oh, nice bike. There's this instant connection between the two. And the guy starts talking about his father and how they built bikes together. And this, it was just so cool. It, it's not about the bike. It's about the connection. And I kept hearing it as I walked around on oh, nice bike. You'd see these people connecting and talking and starting to make this relationship build. And so that's, that's where it all started. And I, I've, I've built on nice bike and it's all about the relationship side of business, how we connect with other people, how we acknowledge them, honor them, and most of all, connect with them. So really taking that phrase with you and remembering nice bike is something we can all do. And I've done it, you know, since I, since I, you know, whenever I rethink about you or, or you come back on my radar, I'm like, oh yeah, nice bike. It's so important to relate to everybody. And this is a great way to remember it because not everybody has a bike, but everybody has something nice, right? Everybody has something about acknowledging. You can acknowledge, you can honor by creating a great moment for them and connect by making it personal. You know, it's it's amazing when, you know, it, TSA tells us, it tells us if you see something, say something. <clears throat> nice bike, if you see something, say something to acknowledge others. I mean, two of our greatest needs as human beings, once our basic needs are met, staying warm, food, water, clothing, all of Maslow's stuff. Number one, uh, we need to belong to a family, a tribe, a race of people, a great company, an amazing team. We need to belong because if, if we don't, we're on the outside looking in. And number two, we all need to hear, nice bike. I see you, I hear you. Uh, you know, I value who you are. I value your contributions and what you have to offer. When people belong to something special and they're acknowledged and honored and connected with, performance goes up. Yeah, and this is a central theme that, that so many great speakers talk about in the fields of communication and negotiation and sales. And it's all about empathy. It's all about acknowledging and, and, and really hearing the other person, right? It's about connecting. I mean, I was uh, at a large meeting in New York City at the uh, the Marriott in Times Square. I'm sure you've been there. A lot of meetings there. It's it's Marriott Marquis. And Bill Marriott was speaking, his hotel. And there was a session for about 75 of us after his main keynote in a, in a smaller room. And I haven't been around many celebrities. Judge Judy once in the airport, but that was very brief. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm kind of following him, uh, getting close, not a creepy way, but looking back, I guess, a creepy way. But uh, <laughs> I was curious about it because I've seen his picture in all these hotels, Marriott's I've stopped in. I'm a fan of Marriott. And we're on the second or third floor and we pass this guy who's polishing the marble floor. And Marriott passed him, then he turns around. So I turned around and he said, excuse me, my name is Bill Marriott to the guy. Uh, can I get your name? And the gentleman polished the floor said, my name's Juan, sir. He said, how long have you been with us, Juan? He said, seven years, sir. So I'm just curious. Um, first impressions mean a lot at Marriott. And this marble floor looks great, but the corners, that's a round buffer you're using, those corners are looking even better than the main floor. How do you do that? And Juan explained that he takes a cloth out of his pocket and does those by hand first and then does the rest of the floor. Bill Marriott says, you're doing a great job for us, Juan. I really appreciate you being a part of our family. Here's my business card. And he wrote his cell phone number on the card. Said, in fact, is there anything that I can do to help you? And this Marriott, you give me a call. It took about 60 seconds. Bill Marriott knows how you polish those corners. His father made him do it. He had to work his way up. He knows that they, he'll never call him, that Juan will never call him on that, on that cell phone number. But that, that, that business card is going to end up on Juan's refrigerator with little magnetic bananas for the rest of his life. That's nice bike. That's a 60 second leader of a company recognized and acknowledging Juan's efforts, honoring his contributions and connecting with them on a personal level. See, that's a perfect example of nice bike. Yeah. And, you know, in the world that we're living with now, this is such great timing to, to have you on, in my opinion, because um, we need to all be nice to each other. You know, we're all human beings. 
we're divided in a lot of ways. We're, we're um, defensive in a lot of ways. We're worried about a lot of different things personally, professionally, because of the pandemic. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of um, animosity and there's a lot of friction. So really, this is a really strong message for 2021. And, and, I, and I love that, you know, it goes, it goes in so many directions. It can go internally with our own people that we work with or work for us or we work for even. It works in all those directions, but it also works with our customers. And um, I know that you have some incredible stories. One of my favorite stories that that you tell is the one uh about the box that's just (laughs) it's just such a funny story tell me tell me that story again because it's been a while since i've heard it i spoke for a company called uh, pca packaging corporation of america Uh, i love their product because i understand it fully it's a box (laughs) they prefer you know they prefer to call it a, a container but it's a box anyway uh the cool thing about the company as I'm researching them before my presentation and when I'm meeting with their people at the event, uh, during the Great Recession 2008, 2009, they grew in market share from 7% market share to 9% market share. So what's that revenue per year in the box world? It was $2.8 billion in sales, which is a lot of boxes. (laughs) The cool part is their boxes cost more than their competitors' boxes. And when I tell that to an audience, oftentimes they sit and look at me and I go, well, perhaps I was a bit more enamored with this fact than you are right now. <laughs> Keep in mind, it's a box. Right. It doesn't sing. It doesn't dance. It doesn't save lives. Uh, it doesn't make you look thinner or sexier. It's just, it's a, I mean, can you see their national sales manager in, in a Marriott hotel ballroom? <laughs> okay, people, here's this year's model. Uh, that's a P36. <laughs> She's been a great seller for us, but uh the Canadians have raised the price of pulp again, so we had to bump up the prices on you. So, but go out there and sell a whole bunch and win the trip to Reno. You know? <laughs> right, because it's mean, just a box. It's why, a why is it box. more expensive than the com- competitors? And you can you can have a lot of people out there that are in sales saying, "Oh man, our job is so competitive and so tough." Well, try selling a commodity at this at a higher price than your competitor with the very same product, and let's see how good you are. And yeah. it boiled down to when I talked to a national sales manager. I mean, I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I do not ask the simple question of how'd you do that? Yeah. And it, it boiled down to, he said, Mark, if everybody was doing it, if there was a silver bullet, all of our competitors would be doing it with three core values. Uh, the golden rule, treat people like you want to be treated with, with you know, respect, over deliver, you know, just jump through hoops to whatever you can to, impress and, and surpass your promise and then we're connected from sales to manufacturing to the people who load the trucks it doesn't make a difference what the product is what the service is it's us working together as a team to grow and to build as individuals and as a company i, I mean one of the things I've, that, that amazes me more than anything else chris is that when i one of the greatest opportunities for speakers is to be able to sit in all these ballrooms and listen to some of the greatest business leaders, some of the greatest association leaders in industries across the board. Yeah. I mean, we could just sit in the front row and listen to these CEOs and all these different industries talking about where they're going with it. And the biggest difference to me are going back to what the box company had, core values. When core values are stated, understood, and lived, those companies hands down outperform those who make it up along the way. I've seen this time and time again of people more than just an employee handbook, but in the minds and hearts of the entire team every day, those are the companies that are just absolutely amazing to work for and to do business with. It all boils down to leadership. Uh, The first 20 years of my career, I was a high school assembly speaker. And I don't mean, uh, you know, ag ag groups and uh, church groups. I mean, 2000 kids in a gym. If you want to learn how to be a speaker, uh, grab the microphone for 60 minutes with 2,000 kids in a gym throughout the country. You learn quickly how to grab attention and keep them with you. What were you talking about? Engagement. My presentation was called The Greatest Days of Your Life So Far, which means that high school is not the best time for everybody. You heard that from your parents. Oh, these are the greatest days. No, for a lot of people, they're not. But as long as you're here, be a part of it. 
uh, being, be involved, be engaged in some level. This is a time when you grow. This is a time right. from freshman year to senior year, you develop as a human being. So it may take advantage. The biggest difference between high schools, simply the high school principal. Uh, it didn't make a difference to demographics, didn't make a difference to social economic, what part of the country. Show me a great leader and I'll show you an absolutely amazing school. Hmm. And and I've, I've been to schools where it was a so-so school, they brought a new leader and three years later, top performing school. Same in industry, same in any business. Give me great leadership and uh, it's incredible. You know, one book I'm gonna recommend for you if you haven't read it yet, Team of Rivals, but Abraham Lincoln, how his cabinet were people that ran against him, that opposed him, didn't think very much about him and how he battled with them to get the best ideas possible. Mm -hmm. He made the final decision. But if you want to read a great book about leadership, Team of Rivals is incredible as far as how Lincoln led through the most difficult time in our country with people that were attacking him constantly. Yeah. And he had found ways to pull them together, to move in one direction. I mean, there's there's a million lessons. At Doris, Doris Kearns Goodwin, I believe. A great book. But that's a perfect example of what I think nice bike leadership is. Right. Well, I have to check that book out. That sounds amazing. And you have a book which is called Nice Bike, right? It is Nice Bike, Making Meaningful Connections on the Road of Life. Uh, a, it's a fun read, all story driven, just as my presentations are. Uh, and it's all stories and anecdotes about how we connect with others. I mean, if you break it down to the three points, acknowledge means to be fully present with others. I mean, how many times have you met somebody and 60 seconds later, you have no idea what their first name is? Yeah. I mean, to acknowledge and be fully present in that moment, uh, to honor others by creating great experiences for them that are memorable, and then that connecting by making it personal. Uh, and that's what the book breaks down. How to acknowledge, honor, and connect with others. Nice bike. Yeah, that's that's it's a great book, and I, I highly recommend it. And I know that um, a lot of the people who book you love to give it as gifts to the to the uh, to the audiences, and you also sell quite a few um, when you speak. But you know, I'm starting to think here a little bit about you. You know, you're a guy who is very charismatic. You're very um, engaging, and you're very confident. Um, so in a lot of ways you have this kind of policy of nice bike, but it wasn't you who said nice bike when you first heard that. And, and then you, and then you made it your own brand. You heard another guy say it to another guy, but obviously you, you live that, you know, you live that and, and you teach that and preach that for a lot of people to use that kind of, you know, um, way to say hello to each other and acknowledge each other. But, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people are, are, are shy. A lot of people are scared to, you know, maybe make the first uh, hello or, or acknowledge somebody else just because that's just not their way of doing things. What do you say to those who, you know, are kind of a, afraid to get out of their comfort zone? I mean, you're sitting out there on a frozen lake. You're definitely not in a very comfortable position right now, but you seem to be you, you seem to thrive in that in that kind of a environment. You know, I always thought uh, you're from L.A., right? Are you from California? Did you grow up there? Yeah, I've been here since I was about six and a half. So I grew up in, I mean, I was born in Dallas, but we moved out here when um, when I was about six and a half. See, we, in Minnesota, the middle here up north, uh, people from the East Coast, New York, that area are, are hip and know things. People from California are hip and know things. Minnesota, we're just, we're cold. And... I always thought you had to be interesting to other people. You had to have a great story. You had to climb Mount Everest. You had to accomplish wonderful things in, in this world. And all I am is an observer. I mean, nice bike, it, it's not me. I observe and tell stories. I observe and simplify to make actions that people can take that'll change their lives and the lives of those around them in a positive way. One of the greatest quotes I've ever heard that altered my life, that's not an overstatement, uh, was it was from the, um, the from Texas? There's an airport named after her. First black woman from the great state of Texas elected to Congress. Barbara Jordan was on 60 Minutes years ago, 
And she simply stated, it's more important to be interested than interesting. Yeah. And when you asked me the question of, so what do introverts do? What are people that are kind of shy? What are people that aren't really outgoing out there? Ask questions, be curious. You don't have to have the story. Everybody else has a story. Find out what their story is. Yeah. I don't care if I'm on an airplane, a cocktail party, a reception. When I meet people, I'm curious. Um, I don't really have a story to tell. I want to find out what their story is. And I can ask 10 people questions and nine out of 10 will answer every question we have and be a good conversation. One out of 10, like you will say, hey, tell me about you. What's your story? Mm -hmm. One out of 10 will, will come back with that. And that's what amazes me. Uh, I, I met um, PFJ, Pilot Flying J. It's at their travel centers. Yeah. We call them truck stops. You ever driven by one? They're all over yeah, the country. Yeah, I know them very well. Flying J is another one. Flying J, yeah. They've combined Pilot Flying J. Uh, $20 billion in, in uh, revenue a year, largest seller of diesel fuel. Their, their customers are professional drivers. Yeah. James Haslam, the second, he's, he's well into his 80s, started the company back in 1958, bought a gas station for, came home from Korea where he fought in the war, bought a gas station for $6,000. And now he's worth just north of $3 billion himself. Wow. I'm speaking at his meeting. He's in the front row. He's worth $3 billion. He's into his 80s. He's at the front row of the meeting. Love it. Talk about great leadership. Yeah. And I met him. And the first thing out of his mouth was, because he's got that great Tennessee, well, Mr. Mark, uh, <laughs> tell me tell me, uh, tell me, something about yourself. Who, who are you? <laughs> Just great. And I got to ask him questions back. And I said, you know, Mr. Hasm, how did you do this? How did you build this amazing business? Yeah. It gets back to the nice bike as far as being interested in others. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, our, our business is based upon professional drivers. And I asked them, what would it take to bring you back? Right. And they said, nice, hot, clean showers. Mm -hmm. So we built nice, clean, hot showers and they came back. <laughs> it ain't racket science, son. Right. God, ask your questions, ask your customers what they want and take an interest and follow through and they'll come back. So the answer to your first question, how do you connect with others? Be curious, take an interest, find out what their story is and go deep on the questions. Were you speaking um, when you were driving in your Ford uh, beige Taurus rent a car? Were you, were you like, had you just landed and you were taking your car to? Yeah, I was going to an engagement. You're going to engagement. So, so nice bike wasn't yet your, you know, your brand or, or something that you were thinking about. No, actually I was, I was speaking to a group of teachers, educators in Eno, Wisconsin, K-12, about a thousand educators kicking off their year. School started the very next day. And in my presentations, it's not cookie cutter. I want it to be an authentic conversation yeah. with the audience. I don't want, I don't want it to be, this is speech number 37. I never want that. I want, every speech, like it's my last one. I, I mean, I know that sounds like a cliche, but I remember my last speech before COVID hit and I can't wait to get back. I mean, it's, but I'm speaking to all these educators and I said, you know, the first, and I talked to them about all the Harleys and everything else. And I, I did the little nice bike rift on it. And I said, you know, tomorrow when school starts, if you stand by your door, and a student walks in and says, saying, good morning, good morning, good morning. If you go, oh, Chris, it's so good to have you in my class this year. Gosh, it's great to see you. That's a nice bike. And they nodded. And when an audience all together nods, you've got something. And so a simple ad lib turned into a short story, turned into a strong story, turned into a premise, turned into a brand, turned into a, a great message of how we make meaningful connections with others. Yeah, it is really a great message. Do you think to yourself, like I'm thinking to myself, that this might be the most important message that people need to hear going forward in this this post-pandemic world, this new uh, you know administration coming in? Hopefully, uh, more unity will 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 eventually 
come in the in the next months and the, the next few years what where do you see your message and you in your positioning with what our nation and what people what humans need to hear i mean where do you are you thinking a lot about that right now that's a great question short answer is yes i mean COVID has taught us a lot hopefully we've learned hopefully we'll all come out of this with greater insights and perspectives one of them is we need to be connected as human beings I mean, it's one thing to sit at home and watch a football game, an NFL game. It's one thing to watch it in a bar with a bunch of people on a big screen. But to be at the stadium, that's memorable. Yeah. When, when we're together with a large audience, I mean, I, I can't wait for us all to get back together in a ballroom and laugh together and have emotions together and learn together. And as, and as people are walking out, hey, what'd you think? And that interaction right in the hallways. Yeah. They say, I like that part about it. And yeah, I, I never thought about that. I'm looking forward. We need to be connected together to learn and to experience and, and to grow. And secondly, that's why I go back to team arrivals with Lincoln. I mean, after the civil war, uh, I mean, they wanted to hang Jefferson Davis. They wanted to uh, retribution revenge. And Lincoln said, absolutely not. Uh, is it, is it malice towards none and charity for all we've, I, I can't remember who said it, but, we're not enemies. We have a different viewpoint. We're one yeah. country. And we've got to, A, find common ground, be more respectful to each other and be able to listen. Hey, where are you coming from? Let me try to understand where you're coming from. Not debate you, but let me, let me find out where you're coming from so we can get closer together on this issue. Yeah. We've got to, we've got to drop the, this, this enemy approach, this combative approach. It gets us nowhere. Yeah. A yeah. And I think that uh, the cool thing about, you know, um, people who are working with uh, uh, cool companies where the leaders are strong, um, it doesn't matter who their people are. It, you know, uh, the, 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 the more diverse the company, the more diverse the employees, the more diverse the viewpoints and the backgrounds are, the better the company is going to be because the company is going to be able to, you know, uh, um, make products and and connect with their customers because customers are not all the same customers are all different types and from all different places so um hopefully the leadership that we have in our country the leadership we have in our companies is one where we are forced now um no matter where you're coming from on any on, on any issue we're all forced to really look at each other and say you know what we're all humans and we're all getting through a pandemic. It's been a stressful time. I think the pandemic actually made the political divisions and other things that have happened uh, in the last year more combative and more uh, stressful because there was this pandemic also underneath everything. So emotions were high. People were, you know, locked in their homes and forced to wear masks and not able to make money and closed down and so many things happen to so many people that that anything that was going to be an issue was going to be very combative and very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, passionate. People were going to be pretty angry because um, they already were angry about everything that was already happening. So it's been a, a year where I think that we come out of it, hopefully, and we can all take a, a breath and we can say, you know what, we're all human beings and nice bike. I mean, I love your message. That's why I really wanted this to be a January episode and it worked out great for you to be out there. You didn't catch anything though yet. I, I don't know. Should we? <laughs> no bites yet. No bites yet. It's just a matter of time. You got to be patient. I was hoping we could, we could say nice fish. But <laughs> the other thing I was thinking about is nice Peloton because a lot of people probably have Pelotons now in their homes and uh, you know, my uh, wife does and so many people, you know, got it and they love it. But um, getting back out on the road, getting back out together, like you said, is is going to be so blissful and so wonderful. And hopefully we can all just look at each other in the eyes again and say, hey, we're all humans and we got through this thing and we're going to get through anything. Yeah, as I noted earlier, uh, core values make such a difference uh, for companies, for, for schools, associations. We've got to go back to the core values of this country. We, the people, the United States of America, uh, to work towards a common cause. 
I, I mean, we've been through a, a difficult time with COVID, but I, I look at, at the days of the Civil War. I look at World War II. I look at what the greatest generation went through, the sacrifices that they made. Mm -hmm. I mean, my father, who was in the Pacific uh, on a torpedo bomber plane, uh, 97 times they landed on the top of the Lexington in, in combat and training missions. Wow. And uh, I mean, I, I used to, as a kid, our Saturday mornings after we bought groceries was, groceries was to go to the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars. It's, it's where the World War II guys hung out on Saturdays. And uh, I remember sitting there with Ron Gruber and Bud Streitz, Lenny Keller, Leo Sotzer, drinking an orange crush on a red bar stool, listening to these guys you know, as they chatted. And they talked about the weather, the Vikings, the twins, their kids, <laughs> but they never talked about the war. I never knew that these were American heroes. I never knew that these were the guys that landed on D-Day, my father that fought the Pacific, the guys that survived their brutal baton death march. They gave all and, and never, never complained. Mm -hmm. They did their duty. They, they served their country yeah. uh, honorably. And for, for why? For freedom for others. Yeah. It wasn't for conquest. It was, it was to help others. So that's the kind of country we are. Yeah. To pull together and help others to grow as a country, to grow as individuals, to grow as states. And it, I mean, go back to the core values of why this country was founded and support them. And, and it was built on immigrants. It was built on all being included and inclusive and um, trying to divide us up is silly because it's never going to happen. And we're all, you know, human beings. It's so important to remember that. So, yeah, your dad, I remember there's a really cool story that you also tell about your dad. Uh, the first time you kind of really saw some emotion. That was a very, very, you know, solid group of uh, warriors, those World War II vets and, and didn't show a lot of emotion, a lot of them, right? But your dad was one of those. But there was one day he did show a lot of emotion, right? And it was when you happen to be uh, at a Vietnam memorial? Yeah, you know, my dad only heard me speak once. And oh. uh, I had a presentation in Washington, D.C. I shared a platform with the first lady. She spoke the day before me, it was the same platform. Who was the first lady? <laughs> this is during the days of uh, Ronald Reagan. So nice. it's, uh, this is Reagan. Wow. It was a, it was a drug free conference and a uh, large conference. I spoke at it, my dad heard me. and. That night, I flew my dad out there. I said, Mom, you know, come with us. And I'll take your father, do me a favor. <laughs> and it was, we were at the Lincoln Memorial, standing where Martin Luther King stood, looking out. And we went that direction. We stumbled upon the Vietnam Memorial. Yeah. Now, my age, I was in the lottery. Of, I was in the draft. My number was 256. Wow. Uh, guys on TV drew birth dates and numbers. If you had a low number, you're going to Vietnam. If you had a high number, you were home. Wow. Which meant that guys, guys served in our place and we'll forever remember and honor them. And the rest of us were home. And my dad and I are walking the wall and there were two Vietnam vets standing very quietly by themselves. They had the uh, army jackets on. And my dad came up to him and he, I mean, he's kind of a tough guy, not real emotional. He said, excuse me, fellas, uh, where were you over there, Vietnam? And the guy said, yeah, yeah, we were. Thank you, fellas. Welcome home. And that guy looked at my dad and he said, sir, you're the very first person who, ever, who has ever said thank you to me for serving the country I love. Wow. He gave my dad a big bear hug and my dad was not a real hugger, but he <laughs> hugged back. He hugged back. That's good. And there was this connection. It, it was nice bike, Chris. Yeah. My, dad, my dad acknowledged them. He honored them by saying, thank you. He connected with them by making it personal. And I mean, those are life changing moments. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot to change a person's life, but to acknowledge them, honor them and connect with them. I and think that's what lot, nice bike is. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of opportunity for all of us all around the world to say nice bike and thank you to each other, the frontline right. workers, the medical workers, even the leaders that kept our companies afloat and for the leaders to say to their workers and the people who work for their companies, thank you for working from home. Thank you for 
for focusing on the job and getting your, your tasks done. I mean, there's so many opportunities for us to say thank you and nice bike. So again, well, I mean, yeah, I know because our, our, our kids, uh, our son and daughter all live in, in Brooklyn, okay. right across from a, a trauma center. Mm-hmm. And seven o'clock every night, they're, they're out yeah. on their fire escape with pans banging. I mean, what did that do for these people? That kept them going. It's a beautiful uh, thing. It, it is. And so, again, uh, if you see something, say something. Let's go out there and support each other. We might have different viewpoints. We might be different from each other, how we grew up, where we came from. But we're one country. When we work together, we're amazing. Yeah. And, and, a, and a vast majority of us Americans and human beings are of that mindset. It's really a small percentage of people who kind of uh, uh, don't think that way, unfortunately. So we've got a we've got a rule. We've got to stomp them out. But uh, your message is just so prevalent and, uh, um, and 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 important and relevant today more than ever. So I'm really excited we got to spend this time together. You agreed to do this. You went out on the lake safely on very very frozen ice. Hey, this is this is fun. I love it out here. I can tell. And you've had no hat on in 30 degree weather the entire time. So thank you for doing that. You're the man. My pleasure. Hey, uh, this is the fastest uh, interview I've ever had. Thanks, Chris. You're great to have a, have a talk with. My pleasure, man. Yeah, this was a wonderful conversation. Again, thank you so much. And Mark, nice bike, my friend. Ah, sweet. Nice bike, Chris. Thanks. Take care, sir. Thanks.